you wanted the best, you've got the best podcast, the hottest, hottest. podcast in the world. In the world. The Chris Voss Show, the preeminent podcast with guests so smart you may experience serious brain bleed. Get ready, get ready, strap yourself in, keep your hands, arms, and legs inside the vehicle at all times, because you're about to go on a monster education roller coaster with your brain. Now, here's your host, Chris Voss. Hi, right, folks. Chris Voss here from the Chris Voss Show dot com. Let's get ready to podcast. I don't know. Maybe that should be the intro of the show. I don't know. Uh, anyway, guys, welcome to the show. Who knew we do another? Uh, thanks for tuning in. Be sure to go to all of our channels, youtube.com, Fortress Chris Voss, for your family, friends, and relatives. Say if you uh, join the Chris Voss Show family that loves you but doesn't judge you yet, uh, get everybody involved in the program. Go to all the groups on Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter, Instagram, all those places. Our big LinkedIn group, 132,000 people over there. And uh, the LinkedIn newsletter, I just I just checked in and we picked up like another 50 people on that newsletter. It's in the thousands now. It's getting crazy where it's going. Hopefully we're going to hit the big 10,000 mark. So check it out on LinkedIn over there. Goodreads.com for chess. Chris Foss. You can find my books and uh, everything we're reading and reviewing over there as well. Today we have an amazing prolific author on the show. As always, we have just amazing, brilliant people on the show. And uh, he's going to be talking to us about his new book that's going to be coming out April 19th. 2022 so you want to definitely get that pre-ordered so you can be the first on your block or your book club to tell everybody i read it first darn it there you go uh the book is called making history the storytellers who shaped the past by richard cohen he's gonna be on the show with us to talk about everything he's been doing with uh books and uh, he's written uh, for quite a few different people books and everything else he is the author of chasing the sun by the Sword and How to Write Like Tolstoy, the former publishing director of two leading London publishing houses. Cohen has edited books that have won the Pulitzer, Booker, and Whitbread Costa Prizes. Well, 21 have been number one bestsellers. Among the authors he's worked with are uh, the late Madeleine Albright, uh, David Boyes, uh, John Keegan, Richard Holmes, uh, Hilary Sperling, Vanessa Redgrave, Harold Evans, uh, let's see, uh, Studs Turkle, John LeCar, Anthony Burgess, Jeffrey Archer, Jean Owl, Kingsley Amis, and Sebastian Fox. Hopefully I got all those names right. He's been doing this for 35 years, uh, lecturing and uh, doing numerous subjects around the globe. Welcome to the show. How are you, Richard? Well, very happy to be on your show. Thank you. Very for happy to have you. And, and what a wonderful uh, resume pedigree that you have. Um, I was very lucky to have some wonderful authors over the years to be editing. Um, and some of the best authors um, may not have been famous, but they became good friends. That's one of the pleasures of working in publishing. There you go. Well, good people becoming good friends rather than uh, good enemies is, is always healthy, I think. <laughs> So, uh, what is a, a dot com where people can find you, or places people can look you up on the interwebs to get to know you better? They can look me up on Richard Cohen Author. Mm -hmm. That would be the best means. I don't go on Twitter now. I'm mm -hmm. too bad at it. But I've got a Facebook page which has got a lot of, I think, amusing stories on it. There you go. There you go. So, uh, what made you want to write this new book? Um. There are more serious reasons, but really the first reason was the same as with the Sun book. Um, I wanted to read a book about the Sun in all its various aspects, not just mm -hmm. astronomical and so on. And it didn't exist, so I decided I might as well write it myself. And the same with historians. Um, I felt that history, importantly, is two, has two different meanings. You know, it's the past but it's also the writing of the past. So that um, the writing about history, um, you see the past through somebody else's filter. And I thought, looking at all the people who have given us a sense of what the past has been, what mm -hmm. kind of people were they? What were their agendas or um, biases? Um, you know, to what extent did their health make a difference to the way they wrote? Their 
patrons, financial pressures, rivals, all those kind of things, political pressures particularly. Um, and did that affect the kind of the kind of stories about the past that have come down to us? Hmm. So who are some of the people you feature in the book? Uh, who are some different storytellers that you feature? I remember um, speaking to a, a Spanish professor, friend of mine, and he said, this is, I should excuse myself in, in terms of my accent, but he said, oh, Richard, you're not going to begin with Herodotus, are you? It's so boring. So I don't begin with Herodotus. I've got a rather unusual beginning to the book. Um, which explains my main themes. Um, but then I go on to Herodotus because I read him, as, I hadn't read him before, I read him as research for this book. Mm-hmm. And I loved him. And I used to come to the supper table in, here in my apartment in New York and read passages to my wife. And she'd say, isn't there more? Isn't there more? And it wasn't the same when I then went on to Thucydides and some of the great Roman historians. Mm. But I go... I- from those early Greeks right up to the present day, the kind of teledons. Mm-hmm. Wives usually are that way. They're always, is, is there more? Is there more? More? I'm just kidding. Uh, I think that's only when they get on Amazon or something and go shopping. Uh, <laughs> Amazon, and now I suppose my wife is also the person who agents my books. So uh-huh. Amazon discounted it to sixteen ninety five. That must be a good sign. So buy now while the <laughs> by now well at last there you go um so uh what other uh writers did you feature in the book um well one of the main arguments in it is it's not necessarily or even always the people who are in the universities the academics who give us our idea of history now some academics some history professors have written wonderfully about the past but you know, herodotus and thucydides were absolutely not part of any Greek academy in as much as it existed. Herodotus was a perpetual traveler, something of an exile. Um, Thucydides was an exile. He was an unsuccessful general who was slung out of the army and mm-hmm. went nursing his room, his mm-hmm. wound, and decided to write a history of the, of the Peloponnesian War. Um, but I also have a chapter, unlike most books about history and historians, there aren't that many, Uh, I have a chapter on Shakespeare, who probably set our our ideas about certain figures, Henry IV, Richard III, Richard II, Mm -hmm. um, you know, let alone Caesar and Antony and Cleopatra, more than any historian has done. Um, I've also got a chapter on historical novelists, um, who I think have added to the historical record in wonderful ways. So uh, what are some uh, teasers or tidbits that people can find or stories that you think that are going to be, uh, that maybe were some of your favorites or you think readers will like? Um, a friend of mine said, Richard, you suffer from footnote-itis in that I love putting in small, really interesting footnotes. And a couple of those is a Russian soldier during the uh, invasion of Budapest in 1956 came across um, a famous Hungarian literary critic. He's, the Russian soldier said, hand over your weapons. And uh, Lukács, with his name, um, stretched into his jacket pocket and took out his pen and handed it to the soldier. <laughs> um, another time, there was a, a very well-known, in Britain anyway, slightly well-known in America, um, historian called Hugh Trevor Roper, who famously... Um, really ruined his career when he was asked by Rupert Murdoch to go over to uh, Switzerland to assess a um, huge number of pages, which were said to be uh, Hitler's diaries. And he said yeah. they were genuine, and they turned out to be total fakes. Oh, wow. And that ruined his career. But before then, under Margaret Thatcher, um, he was offered um, a lordship to become Lord Dacre, which is a family name. And he was going to turn it down. You know, it's below him. Um, academics ought to be above such things. Mm. And then his wife, who was the daughter of Earl Hay, the famous World War I um, commander, said, just think, if you take it, how many people it will annoy. So he immediately <laughs> to become a lord. 
<laughs> That's a way of uh, approaching things. Uh, let's see how many people you annoy with this. Wait, is that how I run my podcast? I don't know. Uh, <laughs> so uh, what do you hope readers take from this? What do you hope that they learn? I think that maybe readers would say, well, of course, some people have an agenda. Um, they're biased in a particular way. Um, mm -hmm. Not necessarily a bad thing. If you, if you know someone has a bias, it can lead to very interesting history writing. Um, but I don't think people know just how biased all our main historians have been, mm. um, all the reasons why. Um, I was lucky in my editing career to edit um, a British historian, very well known in the States, called John Keegan, mm. who at the age of 11, I think it was, had TB. And although he volunteered the National Service, the doctors just laughed at him. And as he got older, his um, back became more and more crooked. So he kind of walked around towards the end of his life like a crumpled up question mark. Um, but he had inherited from his father a tremendous romantic notion of what it was like to be a soldier. And when he was trying to recover from TB, um, he was put into a hospital full of Second World War soldiers, um, squaddies, you know, not um, commissioned officers. And mm. he was 11, 12, 13, into his teenage years. And they were so kind to him, he carried this romantic enthusiasm and understanding for the normal fighting soldier throughout his life and into his books. Mm. And so when he wrote about war, mm. it was both with a tremendous sympathy for soldiers, and also, um, I think, more than any other military historian I've read, a kind of moral passion about the horrors of war. Oh. You know, what he was made of Putin's invasion of Ukraine, mm -hmm. I dread to think. Towards the last, in the last 20 years of his life, he was a defense correspondent for the Daily Telegraph, and mm -hmm. one of the most brilliant writers of just being a reporter um, who was in Britain or America. Um, and he is always conscious of what was actually happening at the at the tough end, what mm -hmm. it was to be in the trenches, um, to see another person face to face, and the question of whether he would kill you or you kill him. Yeah, that's that sounds like uh, Fridays at my house when uh, there's a fight over I don't know the TV remote. I don't know. <laughs> uh, the TV remote fights over that. I just uh, retreat. I'm like Chamberlain and Munich. I hand it over to my wife and say, this is your job. I take the batteries out first, but that's probably why I'm single. Um, the <laughs> there you go. So uh, this is a pretty interesting book. Uh, the Storytellers are Who Shaped the Past. Why is storytelling important? Uh, why, why is that important in, in our lives? And why do, we, why do we like stories so much? Well, the two things I'd say to that. One is there's a comment by Samuel Johnson, Dr. Johnson, which I think is wise. He said, we like stories because they fulfill us. Mm -hmm. um, I can go on about that, but I just think it's a wise. Please do. Um, but I also want to talk, otherwise I say the one thing and never get to my second thing. Um, one of the things that happened to the writing of history is the writing of history changed over the years. I mean, to begin with, Two and a half thousand years ago, which is where I start my my book, the very idea of tabulating or writing books of writing about the past mm -hmm. uh, wasn't something that most people thought about. Um, the idea of um, putting history down on paper, well, apart from anything else, it, it was an oral tradition in most countries. You know, mm -hmm. that of um, just about every country, you um, told stories of a group. You didn't put things down on, on paper or tablet or whatever. And then it went through you know, chronicles, just a sheer um, putting down of simple facts about what had happened onto annals. And then um, there's a thing called the Anglo-Saxon Chronicles, um, kind of tablets and books which were put on uh, show in churches where you had a chronicle, but people started writing in the margin odd little stories 
about their lives or things they'd seen. And then you go on through the ages um, when you know, people thought, oh, I can actually use my own judgment. I can put in what I think of a particular historical event. Mm -hmm. uh, historians became people who shaped what we take to be history. Um, and then you get in the 19th century, and I'll be brief, a German historian, hugely famous in Germany, called Leopold von Renke. And he said, well, this is in the, the, the mid to late 19th century. Scientists are being applauded. They've got tremendous reputations. And historians, we don't even have a career path. We can't get jobs. So what we'll do, what I'll do, is say, history is a science. And it led to a great debate whether history was a, a science or an art, a kind of false debate. But anyway, he said, um, we'll call history a discipline. And we'll say there's certain rules to how you write about the past. You've got to go to primary sources. You've got to be objective, whatever that means, and certain other things. Um, and um, this got accepted. And in the last part of the 19th century, um, throughout Europe and the States, uh, schools of history began to develop. Professors of history um, uh, came to be. And that set about um, something which was good for historians in one way, but it also suggested that there was a way of writing history, that you had to be academic in tone and manner. And not always, but history lost its narrative drive. The business of telling a good story um, became secondary to a certain kind of academic seriousness. Now, there have been some great uh, serious academic histories, but the best histories on the whole, I'd say maybe, this is a stretch, but 80% of the great works of history we have have been written by non-professional historians because they are the people who realize the importance of storytelling. Hmm. Is that what really define them as the great historians is the ability to tell stories? Do we have people that got lost in the mix? Cause they're like, you know, they tried to keep track of history, but they didn't really have any good stories. I mean, I mean, if you look at the Bible, it's a, it's a, you know, regardless of what you think of, whether it's fact or fiction, you, it, it's a, it's a great bunch of parables and stories and, and stories in a lot of ways are lessons, you know, they're, they're ways of handing down, you know, cause you don't, you, you don't come into life with a manual, unfortunately. I think there's a superhero show about that, the great American, whatever. Um, but, you know, the stories are a way to pass some of that knowledge down too. Yeah, you're absolutely right. I've got a chapter um, on the Bible, just I have a mm. on, on Shakespeare and the more obviously historical writers in the Bible. Um, they were not historians. They mm. were propagandists. Um, oh. so you and the Old Testament. Um, they were putting out a cause. Now, in the process of doing that, um, I think a lot of um, your Christian listeners or Jewish listeners may take issue with it, but it's generally agreed now that there's a huge amount of history in the Bible, but that's almost a byproduct of what they were doing. They weren't setting out to be serious um, historians. And, you know, with any of the books that have been made usually under the, 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 the blank of the umbrella of religion, um, you know, a lot of them have basic self-help. They're kind of basic self-help, positive affirmation manuals, you know, and same things I might find if I read uh, uh, Covey or some sort of, you know, uh, Tony Robbins or something. They're, they're good life lessons. And I think to me, stories are, are really big on lessons that we learn from each other helps us realize we're not alone in the universe. Um, uh -huh. Huh? <laughs> I sometimes feel we are. Um, but um, no, you're absolutely right. But I mean, stories, the, the writers of stories have still got to select and shape their material mm -hmm. um, according to what they're trying to achieve and what they know. I mean, I keep on saying writers, but there's one section in my book where I talk about the Bayeux tapestry. And that tapestry... Um, com that was stitched together by English nuns under the direction of a Norman baron um, to tell the truth or otherwise of the Norman conquest. And what resulted was a, a work of propaganda, but also one of the greatest narrative accounts 
of that period of history. Oh, wow. So it's written word. It's pictorial narratives as well. Hmm. Isn't it, isn't it interesting how that all plays out and works out in the end? Uh, at, at how, uh, you know, these, these stories, I mean, this is why we love, you know, I didn't realize this till I was in my late forties, maybe when I turned 50, how important stories were. And I've been telling stories all my life. Uh, and a lot of the stories I've been telling were more my history. And in, I learned recently from one of our great authors who we have on the show that in Africa, there used to be, or maybe there still is what are called griots. And they're uh, verbal historians that before we had the ability to write our words down, our history down, they were uh, they worked in the tribes in Africa and they were the ordained historian of that tribe. And their job was to uh, keep track of the oral history, verbal history of that tribe, since that was the only way to record it. And so and then, of course, when they would uh, get it's the end of their uh, life, they would pass it on to another griot who that, that was their job was to collect the history of that tribe and pass down the lessons. And so I didn't realize that all my life I'd been repeating my stories and telling to everyone because I really needed to write them down. Since I've written them down, I forgot whatever the hell they are. I have to go read the book now to find out what they were. Um, but, <laughs> but uh, storytelling is, is a part of how we teach ourselves lessons. You know, when you watch movies, you're looking, there's lessons that you learn in movies. There's lessons that you read in books from stories. You know, there's all sorts of things that we, you know, I was just, uh, I was just working on a post earlier today that I've, I've got to put forth. And I, I quoted the, um, the line from Socrates, a life, an unexamined life is not worth living. And so it, it kind of stories also kind of act as a mirror to our lives where they, can present hey here's how you're living a life and you're like mm, i don't know maybe i should change something here or maybe this isn't as good or maybe there's a way to enrich it more and so uh to me stories just have so much versatility you've written your book on leadership mm -hmm. watching john keegan um in the um 70s he wrote a book called the mask of command mm. and in that he was considering what makes good leaders mm-hmm and this was military leaders um, rather than political ones. Well, um, and he brought the book to life by telling stories of Grant or um, Eisenhower or other figures who he thought had been really successful leaders. Mm -hmm. All of, he then describes the necessary mask that military leaders and I think political leaders have to adopt a certain air of authority and mystery and charisma if they're going to be successful so that it, was him um, putting his ideas across in the form of stories yeah and those are really necessary too because people aspire to a certain type of leadership or they excel uh and deliver their most to a certain type of leadership um that inspires them motivates them and moves them uh what are some other aspects about your book that we haven't touched on so far well i've got a chapter called Bad History. <laughs> um, the theme of that chapter kind of radiates out through the whole book, which is um, how every culture creates myths mm. about the past, whether it's King Alfred burning the cakes uh, because he was thinking about more important matters, or um, King Canute um, you know, telling the waves to stop um, which actually wasn't what he was doing at all. He's trying to prove to his court that he couldn't make the waves to, to stop and they shouldn't keep on thinking of him as some kind of all powerful god um, or Robin Hood. Or, um, every society has stories which have scant relation to what actually happened, but mm -hmm. they're very important to how a particular nation thinks of itself. Mm -hmm. They heroes. Um, and I write about um, some of the worst um, perpetrators of bad history, false history. Um, and I have a chapter, or in that chapter, I talk about the way Japanese um, governments um, won't allow the truth about Japanese um, actions between 1931 um, and 1937 mm -hmm. on to 1945 to be in school or university textbooks. Yeah, and I talk about and this is well before obviously 
Putin invading Ukraine. Yeah. About how first Stalin and then Putin、um, tried to make Soviet history and then Russian history to their liking and ironing out anything which seemed to show their country in a bad light. And、mm-hmm. Putin,、um, well, first of all, the biggest school publisher in Russia is government run, which is a source of very good funds. We know how keen Putin is on making money, and、um, they may have. First print runs of a million copies or more. Anyway, Putin,、um, through several diktats、uh, and government decrees, has outlawed certain tellings of Russian history、wow. and predicted what he thinks Russia should be saying. And since I, I wrote the book,、um, President Xi in China has said exactly the same thing: that his government would rewrite history according to what he thinks Chinese history, how it should be understood. Isn't it interesting that in the end, I suppose you you do that to maintain power while you're alive, but it, it's always funny they don't seem to learn from history that even when you try and lie and change it, you know. For example, I think I think the Japanese thing you're referring to is some of the things where they with the with the, where they、uh, the rapes and the the attacks of of women and enslavement of women during wartime and stuff like that. Women was the awful phrase. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, and they wouldn't. They yeah, it was it was horrible, and they they denied it for I think up until a few years ago or ten years ago or something. Well, that the the、um, massacres in Nanking, yeah,、uh, biological weapons that they used, yeah,、um, in every country I think it's probably got events in their history which are shameful. But unless you face up to them and realize that the truth about your past needs to be put into context, and you shouldn't be hidden, then Um, it's a slippery slope, and、yep. the difference between truth and falsehood get lost. Yeah, even America has that problem. I mean, we've had a lot of historians on that have been digging through、uh, our history, and a lot of it is "quote unquote" whitewashed because of so much of it was ruled by white people, and and、uh, there are stories they didn't want to tell. And now there's, you know, the truth comes out eventually. What and what I started on earlier. Was the interesting thing about the Russian, Chinese, the Japans, and, and likely us, is the things that you think you're buried, like eventually come out in the wash anyway. Like you're going to be remembered for that. Actually, you know, it's kind of like it's kind of like Will Smith right now.、Uh, no one's going to remember all the great acting parts he did. They're going to remember him slapping some of the Oscars. So maybe you know, don't hide your don't hide your stuff. I mean, take the good, the bad, and the ugly. The one thing man can learn from his history is man never learns from his history. Well, I think.、Mm-hmm. Go ahead. I was just going to mention、uh, the Soviet writer Alexander Solzhenitsyn, who probably, as a novelist, has done more to influence our understanding of the past, the gulags and so on, than any other novelist who's ever、uh, who's ever lived. But he said, you know, the truth will come out in the end. We、mm-hmm. may take several generations.、Mm-hmm. Yeah, I should have been the one to quote that, shouldn't I? Should have had that. I, I probably have heard that phrase, but yeah, it always comes out in the end. There's no, there's no point in whatever. But I mean, if you, I guess if you need to maintain power in the short term and fool all the people until they、uh, until they lynch you up like they did Mussolini, or you end up with a putting your own gun to your head or drinking your own poison like、uh, Hitler, then、uh, there you go. And hopefully that's the end of of those people.、Um, the、uh, but it seems like we 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 let. We we continue to let them rise because we don't learn from history.、Uh, this has been pretty insightful. Anything more you want to tease out on the book before we go? <laughs> well, I could keep you going for several hours on. Well,、um, we want people to go buy the book. We don't want to give them the whole thing. Well, it's seven hundred and fifty-three pages.、So、oh, well, we got time then. I'll keep people. Don't drop it on your toe.、Um, uh, one thing which isn't in the book, incidentally, talking about Mussolini, he's a rather successful writer,、uh-huh. and his youth was.、Uh, Writing for、um, a newspaper in the Tyrol, I think. Anyway, part of what was、um, then Italy, and he was writing for what was a kind of colour supplement.、Mm-hmm. And his editor said, "Now, Benito, you, you've got a lively storytelling gift.、Um, write a story for us." And so he wrote、um, what became a published novel. But after a bit, it made the colour supplement, as it were, hugely successful. Put on hundreds and hundreds of readers.、Mm-hmm. The editor said, "Benito." I like what you've written very much, but you kill on keep on killing off all the main characters. 
But he published it <coughs> as a book. It was called The Cardinal's Mistress. Oh. Which, it was that book that Dorothy Parker said, this is not a book to be put aside lightly. It should be flung away with great force. Oh, well, evidently she didn't like it. Or she maybe she did. I don't know. Either way. If you fling a book away with great force, I don't think you're planning to advise friends to read it. <laughs> uh, that reminds me of a great thing that someone wrote about who was uh, who replied to a, a reviewer. I think it was of their symphony or something or their orchestra. Maybe it was about a book or an art piece. But they, they wrote back to a, a, a critic of a newspaper or some sort of publication and they said, your your review sits before me in this. I sit in the smallest room of my home, and your review sits before me. Soon it will be, be soon it will be behind me. Um, I thought that was, was a beautiful, eloquent way that you could put something of that nature. You were asking, um, sorry, what was that you were asking about um, small stories? Uh huh. One of the one. It is a footnote in my book. I'm writing about Tolstoy, who is fascinated by history and. War and Peace is an attempt to really show what had happened in the Napoleonic Wars with Russia. And um, most of the people in War and Peace are based on real people. And the wonderfully um, sympathetic figure of Natasha is built on a, a young relation of Tolstoy's. And I tell that when she was 17 or 18, um, she had an unhappy love affair mm. and decided to kill herself. And um, swig back some poison and then there was a ring on the door and she rushed down and found a very good looking young aristocrat who wanted to take her out so she rushed upstairs again to her mother and said can I have an antidote quickly please wow that'll I mean that sounds like every time I go on Instagram actually I don't know what that means <laughs> uh, so there you go well it's been wonderful to have you on the show to talk about this uh, Richard so insightful and wonderful. Uh, people should order your new book up. Uh, give us your plugs so people can find you on the interwebs. Well, as I say, Richard Cohen author will take you um, to my Facebook, which gives a lot of details about um, stories about the book and my life generally. Or Simon and Schuster are my wonderful publishers. And if you look up the title "Making History" by Richard Cohen, um, Simon and Schuster, you'll get all the various. Um, plugs you need to follow up on what I write about. There you go. And I'm even noticing here on Amazon it says editor's pick for best history. It's pretty darn good. I didn't. Ha I I paid him in ice cream to write that. <laughs> must have been must have been some good ice cream. There you go. Uh, but of course you've written a lot of uh, wonderful things. How many books have you written total or been involved with uh, editing and stuff? Um, I've written four works of history. Mm -hmm. I'm now. 45,000 words through um, my first novel. Um, I felt I was old enough to start on fiction. There you uh, go. Um, but I've done a couple of anthologies. Um, in 2020, I said to my three children, bad luck, you're not going to get a Christmas present, but you will get an email giving you a present on the 1st of January. And you'll get <laughs> another present on the 2nd of January and on the 3rd, and on the 4th, and on through the whole of the year. And each day, I sent them an interesting story from either literature or history or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, so they ended up with kind of 365 stories, which I then made into a book. So I don't know whether that counts as a book, but it's a lot of work. There, and that, that sounds like it. even having kids is a lot of work, so there's that. I don't know what that means. Anyway, guys, uh, thank you very much for coming on, Richard. We certainly appreciate it, my friend. Well, thank you, and I much enjoyed it. Thank you. Uh, order up the book, folks. Get it. It's a uh, pre-sale right now if you're uh, listening to this broadcast currently. Uh, Making History, the Storytellers Who Shaped the Past, April 19th, 2022. You can order it now today. Wherever fine books are sold, but remember, stay away 
Stay out of those alley bookstores. They can be dangerous. You, you might get robbed. Anyway, guys, thanks for tuning in. We certainly appreciate you. Go to youtube.com forward slash Chris Foss. Read the show with your family, friends. Tell them all to sign up and, and the show. Just grab their phones and subscribe on their iTunes there. Uh, go to goodreads.com forward slash Chris Foss and uh, see everything we're reading and reviewing over there as well. Thanks for tuning in. Be good to each other. Stay safe. And we'll see you guys next time.